I'm Tannen Sanchez, and you're listening to Data, De Aquí y De Allá, a weekly podcast where individuals championing our communities become a collective of healing through storytelling, a true team effort. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll continue to tune in. We are back. I cannot hide my excitement of our guest today. I've been a fan for many, many years. I found her on the Instagram. She's an artiste extraordinaire. Her name is Guppy Shaw, and she's here with us today. Guppy, welcome to Data. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am not so secretly obsessed with your work. (laughs) We'll we'll get into it in a little bit, um, but I want to start from the top. Where are the Shaws from? And am I pronouncing that correctly? The Shaws. Yes, yes. Um, my parents are from India and they immigrated here. Um, my dad came for, um, his, uh, master's degree in engineering. They went back to India, married my mom and brought her back here. Um, and we're, I have two older sisters and we're all born here. So we're first generation, um, Indian American. Very cool. So you were Mm -hmm. born here. Wait, what's your sign? I don't think I know your sign. Taurus. I'm like very hardcore Taurus. <laughs> oh la la. One of my really good pals is a Taurus and I'm picking up that Taurusy energy. <laughs> what are you? Aquarius. Okay. Okay. I have half jokingly for a couple of weeks been like, it's the what is it? It's a superiority complex for me with like a dash of philanthropy. We're just a mess. <laughs> Aquarius is <laughs> This is a self drag. <laughs> we know what's up. Is it season right now? It is. It is. That's We're exciting. finishing up so Aquarius season. season. Okay, yeah. it already happened. It already, already happened, happened. happened, and I, okay. I'm actually doubling down because um, Chinese New Year is on Friday. Spoiler alert: We record this a little earlier, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's the year of the ox, and I'm also an ox in Chinese. Sign, so Perfect. I feel like wow. I'm all in. I'm just gonna ride this, this is your uh, year, this yeah. wave of things. Um, but back to you, back to you, okay. <laughs> Taurus. I love it. So Taurus. you are a artiste by mm-hmm. the entire extent of the word. I absolutely love what you do. You're a ceramics artist. But I want to know when were you first introduced to the world of ceramics? Mm, okay, not many people know this about me, but when I was young. Exclusive. Um, I grew up in the valley. I know. <laughs> <laughs> when I, I grew up in the valley, so think about Clueless. Um, or now I'm really excited because there's never have I ever a Mindy show, which um, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it's my life as a teenager, and I love Ooh. Mindy Kaling, and so I'm like very excited that she made this um, show because it's basically this teenager who grows up in Sherman Oaks, which is where I grew up. Um, and so it's nice that I don't have to reference Clueless anymore. I can say never have I ever. I love um, it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I, uh, used to go to the mall a lot. Um, and there was this store called the Imaginarium and every year they would have a coloring contest. It was, it's like kind of like a science art store. Um, I don't think they exist anymore, but we love this store. My sisters and I love this store growing growing up um and they had a contest every year that you would draw what you wanted to be when you grew up and so i said artist which is kind of surprising because i didn't realize you know it's kind of cool to know that you like wanted to be an artist when you were five or whatever um and so i drew myself with like an easel you know and some like painting some stuff not realizing that i'm much better at 3d art than 2d art um and i didn't win first place but i won like second or third place and so i was able to pick out anything from the store um and i picked out a pottery wheel (gasps) which is very weird that's so poetic i love it (laughs) i didn't make the connection until like much later um and it was this little plastic wheel. You got like, you know, a little tiny lump of clay. Um, but I actually still use one of the tools that came from that pottery set in some of my work. That's so neat. I love that story. How serendipitous. Yeah. Very yeah neat. Right. Yeah. It's magic all around. I love it. I know. I know. I was like, little Gopi was so smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that exclusive. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> so you studied architectural studies and public yes. health, correct? correct? Correct. How does that affect your work? Um, 
it doesn't necessarily anymore. I, I think like in some ways it's, um, I think like for my future, I think I would like to do more sculptural stuff. I do a lot more uh, functional work right now. And I think if I was to go into more sculptural, if I had the time for it, um, I think I would like hone some of those architectural skills that I learned into my pottery. So like making more um, 3D objects that are modeled after architectural Mm -hmm. dimensions and styles. Um, which would be really cool. There's an Australian artist that I follow who kind of does that um, and her work is stunning. Um, and then for the public health aspect, I would say um, I'm very uh, intense about uh, like occupational health and safety. So with pottery as other, you know, other mediums of art, there's always a um, like a kind of health and safety aspect to the work where with pottery and ceramics with clay, if there's clay dust, glucosis, working with glazes, you're just working with chemicals all day. Mm. Um, and so I'm like pretty intense about the health and safety of my studio and trying to make sure that the rest of the people on my floor, cause I'm kind of in a warehouse with other artists, um, are protected as well. But otherwise, it's very different from what I studied in college. <laughs> no, that's really that's really neat, though. I didn't know that fact that you have to be very particular about the space room. Yeah. But that makes perfect sense. Well, yeah, I mean, totally. maybe you should take some pointers from Little Gopi and kind of talk this into <laughs> existence for the future, just like she did back in the day at the Mall and Ups. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so let's talk about your studio. It's in Long Beach. Um, what attracted Beach. you to that part of town? Um, actually it was serendipitous also, uh, my partner, we've moved around a lot in the ca- past couple of years. Um, so we were living in Santa Monica for a little bit. I'm from LA, obviously from Oak. Um, we were living in Santa Monica for a little bit. He got a job in Austin, Texas. We moved there and that's actually where I started my business. Um, and then we moved to San Francisco for his job and then he got a job in Long Beach. And so we're like, we'll try out Long Beach. We both love LA. Uh, but we know what it's about. And so if we don't like Long Beach, then we can always move back to LA. And we tried it out for a year and we're like, oh yeah, we love it. And so uh, (laughs) we ended up just staying. We bought a place um, and I think we're going to stay for a while now. What do you like about Long Beach? No, no shade to Long Beach. I just, I literally have been to Long Beach. I can count the time in my hands actually. And I'm just like a 30, 30 minute drive away. What have you come down for? For the museum. Um, the Latin American uh-huh. Latin American History yep. Museum. I went down okay. for the Aquarium of the Pacific. Okay, okay. For the Queen Mary, all the touristy spots that I'm from okay. here. <laughs> and then I think I took the train down years ago. I must have been like in high school. We took the train down just to take a train. Yeah. And one time to visit a girlfriend, okay. which makes me a not so great girlfriend because she came up here all the time. Shout out, <laughs> Lizbeth. <laughs> Um, we definitely, yeah, we definitely go to LA a lot because a lot of our friends are up there. Um, what I like about Long Beach is I feel like we're in the point of our life where, um, it's nice to have, it's, it's definitely slower pace than LA, but in that way it's, it's kind of nice because it's like your day to day isn't so hectic, but you can always visit LA. It's pretty quick for us. Um, but what I like about it is it kind of combines Austin and LA in a way where it's like, you get all these access to like good museums and concerts and like cool events and great restaurants and whatever. Um, but then you get this small community, small town vibe from Long Beach where you can like, you know, go to a coffee shop and smile at people and say hi and make friends easily. Um, and like the traffic's not as bad and you have the ocean right here, which is nice. Um, so like there's definitely all the, the, uh, benefits of living by the ocean. Um, but it's not as expensive as like a place like Santa Monica or something like that. Um, so I just, I don't know. We like, we've made really good friends here and people just tend to stay and it's nice. Sold. I'm moving to Long Beach. (laughs) Okay. I know. (laughs) Sweet. So what has surprised you about the world of ceramics or how do you refer to this? type of <laughs> I don't is that know, the yeah, proper the way to call it <laughs> um, I think it's great um I think what's surprising maybe is how it's surprising and not surprising but how um much it's exploded in the last decade um so just like pottery studios popping up everywhere um people getting just like really into it buying wheels now during quarantine you know because they don't yeah. have access to the studio 
um, people just really love it. And I mean, it's, it's not surprising because as soon as you take a class or you work with play, it's easy to see why people fall in love with it. It's very easy to fall in love with it. It's nice to be able to touch something, to make something, to have this entire process. It's really meditative. Um, so I understand why people are really into it, but it's nice to see that more people have been interested in it. And then also, I think with that be- uh, comes a knowledge and an appreciation for the work um, and for people who have been in it for a long time. That's neat. I love that. Um, and then you actually mentioned in an interview, I did a little bit of a, a Google deep dive and I was like, I need to know all the things because, you know, <laughs> nothing wrong with being a little bit Research of a lurker on the me. internet. <laughs> So you mentioned in an interview you did a couple years back on the kind craft that you hadn't come across too many other Indian artists at craft fairs and that you would love to see more racial diversity in America's makers movement. Um, What would you say for other BIPOCs looking to enter this world that wouldn't necessarily know how, like what's the best entrance route and what should they be prepared for? Mm, This is very interesting. Um, This is a great question. Um, I think that maybe the playing field is changing a little bit. Um, And and maybe it's like the algorithm or like things are just different now. Um, I think that there probably are more BIPOC crafters and small business owners maybe than there was before. And I'm really glad with the last year with the BLM movement and people trying to support um, people of color and women-owned businesses that I think there is kind of a trend moving towards that way um, and just more awareness about it. Um, I would say to reach out to people that you appreciate and want to learn from. Um, that's like something that I do constantly. Um, if there's somebody that I admire, I would reach out to them um, just to see what their journey was and what were their difficulties, what were their hurdles, what were their challenges, um, how they overcame them. Um, but honestly, it's been really nice because in the last year, I've seen a lot more, um, even diversity of buyers. Um, so like people buying my stuff has diversified. And I don't know if it's like, I don't know what's driving it necessarily, but I am really happy about it because then I feel like I don't have to cater to one sort of audience and I can kind of expand on what I'm actually excited and interested in doing. Neat. If that makes um, sense. It makes perfect sense. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I definitely wanted to surprise you with at least one question. That was a good one. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, what was the first thing you ever made and what was the last thing you made on your wheel? <laughs> okay. Um, I was actually just thinking about this the other day because I had somebody come and pick up an order today. Um, and they said that they took a pottery class and in that part of the they're like, oh, I was really appreciative of the work now because I can see that it's like a difficult medium to learn. Um, and I was like, oh, don't worry. Um, everyone starts off with ashtrays, which is what I made. <laughs> Very perfect. <laughs> I made. Not on purpose. Like, you know, I was like probably trying to make a mug or a bowl or something and it was just ugly and it became an ashtray. And my dad still has it and just tosses his spare change into it and now it's overflowing. But... Probably the first thing I made. Um, and then the last thing I made was today, and they were dinner plates. Ah, very cool. It reminds me of when I was really young and I thought I was going to be a fashion designer. It's like the uh-huh. only thing I know how to make was tube tops or pencil skirts on my dolls. <laughs> it's <Yep>. like <laughs> ashtrays for, yep. for folks in ceramics. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Ari, we had a conversation a um, couple months prior, and one of the things that stuck to me that you mentioned is that part of um, where you get inspiration is from older ceramic pieces. And mm-hmm. there's actually like this broken ceramic pieces up in like the hill, the side of my street. And whenever oh, really? I pass by it, I think of you and I'm like, I got to tell her one of these days, like whenever I walk by this blog, I always think of her because there's like this broken oh, pieces God. of like terracotta pot <laughs> that on like the so side cute. of this hill. But yeah. before then, like my mind would go to ancient Mesopotamia or like all these artifacts that were being um, dug out of like Egypt or wherever else. Yep. Um, yeah. Are you still fascinated by those things? And do you reach yeah. for that for inspiration often? Yeah, definitely. Actually, one of my good friends um, who teaches pottery here at Long Beach um, City College, she's doing a talk tomorrow with one of the um, most, I think, known 
uh, Potters of Long Beach um, about Mimbris, um pottery. And it's um, also ancient pottery um, and it's gorgeous and I love it. And I'm very excited um, to be a part of the talk. So um, it's, he's doing these like really great artist talks where he um, will bring in other potters and other artists in the medium. And they'll talk about different, their work or, you know, other different, work in the ceramic realm um and so it's just it's nice for someone like me who's like a community member to get this like continuing education through him um so yeah definitely still fascinated by it i think like um the craft and folk museum which is now craft contemporary in la um they had a lot of um ancient pottery um and they continue to do like craft art and kind of folk folk art, which is what I'm interested in. And I, I think I just really also like the stories behind the folk art um, and the depictions of, you know, what they thought the gods were, religion or the stars or whatever that was. Um, just the stories behind it are really interesting. That's so neat. Well, congratulations. That's going to be fun. I'm really glad you touched on the continued education part of ceramics because like most things that people enjoy and is their career it's things continue to evolve and to new realms right um Mm -hmm. how have you seen what where do you see pottery heading into if you have do you have that foresight is is there something that's getting really popular as of late it's hard because i think you know uh, i think it depends on the person um pottery is such an ancient form of craft that it's hard to see it moving in another direction just because it has so many years behind it. I think like the most innovative, I guess, thing for pottery would be 3D printing. Um, But it's also like, okay, do you like programming something and creating it on a printer? Or do you like working with the clay itself? And so for me, I was fascinated by 3D printing originally. Um, It was also when I was in San Francisco, so super techie. and then I was just like, you know, I don't like this. Like the whole point of making a craft is to do it with your hands. And I know, I understand that it's like a completely different skill set and it requires um, knowledge and, you know, whatever to program everything and to figure out the right medium, I guess, to extract from the 3D printer. Um, but personally, I just like the ancient traditions of pottery. Um, and so, I don't know if I really want to moderate, modernize it so much besides doing wheel throwing um, and having like an electric wheel versus kicking the wheel. <laughs> uh, there you go. Get, get some engineers on deck. Let's talk about Ethel's Club. Ethel's Club is a Black-owned social and wellness club designed for BIPOCs to thrive. It's a dynamic community built to center, ground, and inspire. I've been a member since late 2020, and I can assure you the vibes are phenomenal the community is solid, and the gems that are dropped during events keep me coming back. They provide weekly online events that feature a multitude of talented individuals that share their skills and passions. Ethel's Club is generously giving data listeners a month of free access to their platform. To send us an email letting us know why BIPOC community is important to you, you can send your email to hello at teamdata.com. You can get a free week trial by going to ethelsclub.com. That's E-T- H E L S C L U B dot com. See you there. Now I'm going to talk about some of my favorite pieces. Okay. <laughs> so, full disclosure, fan, and a full on buyer of all things Guppy Shaw. I am holding the tumbler in my hand with the bun girl. I was talking to you earlier about how special this mug is, and I only drink certain things out of it. Um, so one of the things that I find really important when supporting BIPOC and women BIPOC artisans is that I'm always a champion for y'all's work, but most importantly, your price points, because I know that small badge takes more energy and effort. And it's not like we're going to, you know, pick up another mug from these big department stores that sell them for like under five dollars on a good day. Yeah. Um, what is something that... Um, have you gotten any pushback or any commentary on your price points? Yeah, I think everyone has probably. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's really frustrating to see uh, 
because I don't make that much money and I do really love what I do and I'm happy and I'm, I think that it's worth the lower amount of income maybe that I get to, you know, be able to do this pottery and, you know, for people like you who do really appreciate my work, it's, that's what really propels me forward. Um, but yeah, there's definitely been pushback. Um, I don't know. I think everyone kind of encounters it. It's really, it's always just heartbreaking to see it. Um, somebody was like trying to get a dollar off something. I'm <laughs> just like, I don't, the, when you're in your salary job, is someone like, I don't think you're worth like $50,000. We'll just give you $40,000 this year. Absolutely. No, that never happened. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. and it's like, you know, I think that people forget also, like I have rent to pay for my studio. I have regular rent. I have, um, you know, kiln maintenance that costs at least like a thousand dollars probably a year. Um, just like there's so much stuff that goes into the pricing. Um, and it's not just like I'm making the $40 off the tumbler and I'm just pocketing that. It really sucks when someone pushes back on pricing, for sure. I, I am definitely a proponent of pay these folks what they ask for, because as someone who's worked in fashion and interior design and now in beauty and the product development end of it, like I know that these bigger conglomerates get to um, have these lower price points because they're buying 3,000 units minimum. But then it's yeah. also questionable yeah. business practices. And then, yes. you know, they're taking the jobs that would have possibly, you know, helped the community immediately. So there's just so many red flags yeah. when anyone's buying something for cheap. I'm just like, I get it. It's cheap and you can get it now, but you can buy five $15 t-shirts that are going to fall apart after three washes, or you can buy a really good one made in LA that's sustainable. Right. It's helping the community immediately for like $45. Yeah. And it's hard for people to see that, but it's, it's, I hope it's something that continues to grow and that knowledge continues to just like expand within the community to better appreciate. It's like, you know what? Maybe I don't need another $7 mug. Maybe I don't need the one with the butterfly and the one with the heart and the one with the like B on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that also, like, you know, during, I think COVID kind of highlighted so much of it when all the small businesses had to close for so long. Because yeah. I was like, okay, what do I appreciate about living here? And what do I appreciate about living in Long Beach? And what do I appreciate about my community? And I was like, it's not that I have Target down the street. It's that I have this, like, um, and we have this kombucha brewer down the street that we love and we get a subscription service from them. Um, and I was like, if they weren't in our neighborhood, that would suck. And if they went under, that would suck. Like, that's yeah. why I like being here. Um, and so I'm hoping that people kind of feel that too. But it is hard to describe that whole supply chain to someone who just doesn't want to know about it or just could ignore it or, you know. There has to be an elevator pitch place. for that. <laughs> Yeah, don't yeah. worry I'm having that conversation for people for you and all the no, other thanks, makers thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going full speed ahead um <laughs> so how do you measure success as a small business owner hmm. um there's so many different ways I think like when I first started my business I was like how much money can I make uh, but I also like you know that's kind of where I come from where that's like what my parents are excited about they're not like oh did you meet anyone at this craft fair like are you in stores they're like how much money did you make <laughs> um shout out parents but, yeah exactly <laughs> and I'm like whatever they're just trying to make sure that I'm okay and that I'm not going to you know be homeless or something um but um I feel like for me success is really I'm most happy when I get responses and messages from customers that are excited about my work um, and that they can see the quality of my work. Um, that's always just like really nice to be appreciated in that way. Um, and like, yeah, the money is great. Like I wouldn't be in my business unless I felt like I was making enough that, you know, I could sustain my lifestyle. Um, but I don't think I would do it. Also, it's just so much work. Like I'm working all the time, right? I wouldn't do it unless I was like really happy in that. I felt like I was contributing in some way to my community. Neat. So we're going to pivot a little bit because I want to talk about our new VP, Ms. Kamala Yay. Harris. She is Yay. half African-American, Jamaican, and half Indian. Mm -hmm. What are your feelings towards her being in the White House? <laughs> well, not she's not um, technically in the White House. She's the VP now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's great. Uh, 
it's surprising, honestly. Um, I didn't think that that would happen. I didn't think a woman would be in a VP or presidential position. And like, you you know, you see that photo of like all the white guys that have come before her. And it's And then she's really, standing the tallest out of all yeah, of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's an incredibly powerful photo, I think. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, obviously I'm like super excited. Um, the, it's so nice that there's like representation, I think, with women. Um, and I think people of color, Black women, um, I think it's like nice that Mindy Keeling again. <laughs> um, she had posted. She's like, "Oh, my daughter saw on TV. Yes, like, oh, like that, that, that woman looks like me." Um, and like, that's incredible for future generations. I think. I hope that um, you know the next president presidential race doesn't swing too far again. I feel like I don't want this giant pendulum. And, um, and I'm hoping that people will see that. Um, the policies that are enacted in the next four years are beneficial to everyone. Uh, and I hope that they're appreciative of that and I hope everything's successful. Same. <laughs> what you said, plus, um, pretty early on, I did some research on her and realized that she didn't have any children. She has adopted, well, not adopted, she was, excuse me, she has children through her husband. Mm -hmm. from his first marriage so it actually got me thinking i was like this is a super powerful woman who is super successful and i mean beautiful of course <laughs> <laughs> and it got me thinking i was like i wonder if the fact that she doesn't have children allowed her to be able to move forward in her career in such a way so mm -hmm. just a thought maybe i don't think that has to be like one or the other uh you know it's like I always feel like successful women don't have like you don't necessarily have to give up anything to be successful. Um, I think it's hard, and I think there is a lot of expectation on women to do all the child rearing and stuff. Um, and I'm hoping that it will eventually change, and that there will be a better like maternity and paternity packages for you know corporate America things like that. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, no, just a thought. Topic. I was like, I, I, like talking about for like two hours. Of course, yeah. I was like, I have to bring this up because that's one of the things that I've actually been thinking about myself. Because when I see yeah. people in the Forbes thirty under thirty world, it's like, oh, that's wonderful. But then we don't really end up knowing their backstory that they actually came from a background where it like was ripe soil for more success. It's like success, of course. success on success, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So yeah. Anyway, that was more me just thinking out loud. Welcome to my yeah. mind. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's, 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 it's one of those where I'm like, God, like I, I think that I've also like thought about that a lot because I was like, I don't have kids um, for a long time. And now my partner and I are finally talking about them. But I was just like, I don't think I can do my business and also the, all the chemicals, and, you know, like stuff like that, where I'm just like, it's really hard to run a business and have a child. Um, but, you know, I'm hoping that things won't be too difficult in a way. <laughs> Helpful. But also like my partner is so dedicated and wanting to have the family. And so I know that at least like I'm in equal partnership with him. And I think it's like having that conversation and having men step up and really fulfill responsibilities of being a father. I love it. Agreed. Speaking of offspring, let's talk about the furry kind. Okay. You have a pet. My cute dog. Yeah. Tell me all about your pup. <laughs> um, I was looking because I was like, oh, he's probably on the couch over here. But, um, <laughs> he's in the bed. Um, he's amazing. Um, I don't know what I would do. Oh, he heard me talking about him and now he's come out. I don't know if you can kind of see him. Uh, oh, there. I see. I see a little movement in the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's a uh, he's gray so it kind of blends in with the rest of my furniture um anyway yeah he's great um we actually adopted him from a friend who had him since he was a puppy in austin and so we got to meet him when we were in austin um and i used to dog sit for him all the time because i had no friends when we first moved there um so i was like oh do you want to like lend me your dog and then you know your dog and i will just have adventures in the city together because i have nothing else to do <laughs> um so we already found, uh, we had formed a bond and then our friend ended up moving and couldn't take him um so we ended up adopting him about two years ago um and he's awesome i just i love him 
he's a Catahoula. They're from the South. And so there aren't so many um, in California. Um, he's gorgeous. What's his name? Hans. Hans. Yeah. Hans. Our friend is half the German. Bu- and so he wanted to give him. I was going to say, that sounds like a very German, German name. name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have some neighbors that are like 10 and eight years old. And they're like, Hans, it's so cute. Did you name him after the prince in Frozen? And I was like, yeah. <gasps> Exactly. Sure, why not? <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's great. He comes to the studio with me every day. Um, probably have more photos of him than I have of pots now. But that's typical of any pet owner, I think. <laughs> Agreed. Most of my camera roll is pup photos. And I have yeah. no regrets. I'll yeah, buy more right I'll, I'll buy more um data just for them yeah. <laughs> to make yeah. sure that I can fulfill it I know, with I'm more like, images. He's like right next to me and I'm like petting him while I'm looking at photos of him on my phone. It's just like this one's so cute. <laughs> Remember this one from yesterday? You were adorable. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> when I was you were like, just well, sleeping. We're getting close to that time and I'm wondering, is there something Perfect. that you're loving these days that you'd want to give cinco estrellas to that's five stars? <laughs> Mm-hmm. something that i've been like very excited about since we're getting through me through some of the months of covid is i started taking this watercolor class online oh. um and it is especially my college roommate my freshman college roommate um lives in new york and was taking this watercolor class at the jewish community center in brooklyn so she was like you should join it and i was like okay and so i started doing it and it's like her and me and like a couple of other young you know my age whatever uh girls and then um a couple of like cool jewish ladies that have like very intense brooklyn accents and they're so it. cute <laughs> um and they make me so stoked I was, like it's on tuesdays and i just i really like it um it's just like really calming in two hours if you haven't tried watercolors i would highly recommend it um it's fun to dabble and I don't know, just like be creative in a different way and not have to like sell it. You know what I mean? I love it. Neat. So go so be what? Think, think I, it. <laughs> I'm into it. So you guys are to watercolor. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the best ways to support your business? Mm, um, if you want to message me and tell me that you love my work. <laughs> that's always awesome. Um, I have an Instagram handle. It's Gopi Shaw Ceramics. Um, my website is gopishaw.com um, but honestly it's just like interacting with me and um, telling people about me maybe um, I don't know just sharing I think sharing um, other small businesses is always pretty exciting especially now where like you know there aren't in-person events um, and it's harder to get out there in the public um, so the people who really appreciate my art I think it's nice to have them talk about it sweet cool well, Gopi, thank you. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Um, I know you're busy, bee, and we appreciate you. We adore you. Um, my next order is coming soon. Yay. I'm going to be forever a patron of Gopi Shah Ceramics. I'm very, very excited. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. So Trump was acquitted, guys. What the F? The only thing I could think about was that I did say that there would be news that would shock us, like, during the month of February. And that's because of all this Aquarian energy. Um, All of it, it is in plans and with the hope that things move forward and that we do the things we have to do to change humanity and break these systems um, apart and to dismantle them, which is the right term, break these systems apart. That sounds so aggressive. I apologize. But really about the dismantling of these oppressive systems. And what better example of this than Trump being acquitted um, and us still seeing that our judicial system and our government is not going to uphold things in the best interests of all. The truth is that the, the riot on Capitol Hill, Hill was a terrorist attack. Trump should be considered a terrorist for doing what he did. And the people who have protected him and him being acquitted is an offense to people who believe in integrity and have high ideals of how to keep us safe. 
on how to keep us safe and what we should do to keep us safe. Um, sorry to shock you with that, but it's just that I think I need to get it out of the way and say something about it because I, I think it's a shitty thing that for the second time we see somebody who is genuinely, blatantly messed up uh, get a pass. And I think that that's egregious and adds more to the trauma that we've already endured um, in general as a population, as people of color, um, the list goes on. Um, but I, I'm here to say that you're not alone with these feelings. If you ever want to DM me and talk about it, I'm more than open to, I'm not an expert. I'm just a person with a lot of opinions who happens to be an intuitive tarot reader and an astrology enthusiast. But I got things to say and I love to talk. So I'm here. All right. So let's shed a little light on the power of Aquarius, shall we? Aquarius is that sign that is the culmination of air energy. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because of why during this month we are seeing and having such strong and like bare bones information. Um, or news that shocks us and impacts us a certain way. And it's because Aquarius is can be compared to that last bit of processing we do before we decide to go forward, like, I'm just going to do this, or we suddenly scrap an idea um, to go in a completely different direction than what we thought to initially, and we just stick to it. Because Aquarius wants to create new realities. Its main focus is to create new realities. It's an unpredictable but cons cons consistent sign in its approach um, with this. So towards the middle of the month, we had this huge stellium in Aquarius. And that was a great example of this, Trump being acquitted and us still being like, what is going on? And that like, like, that bit, that last bit of information and not expecting that that would be the outcome because we had all the details. We, everything was in evidence. Like it was clear, like what more evidence did we need? But then boom, what we least expect is what happened because Aquarius marches at the beat of its own drum. Does this mean that this is going to be forever like this? No, but we can take it as another step towards a new future because every single thing that happens in the present has consequences in the future. That was deep. Wow. Wow. Anyway, moving on. Let's, let's recap February a bit, shall we? So in February, we had the sun, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn all in Aquarius. And this intense combination with the added pressure from Mercury retrograde in the sign, in motion, in the sign of Aquarius, pushed us a lot. Um, I spoke to many people during this month who just felt like they were changing things and they were doing a lot of things um, to make themselves more comfortable, to make things better for themselves. And that wasn't lost on me. That desire to revamp and restructure things in our lives and to release things that don't work anymore. I had a release. Um, there were other people that that had things that suddenly changed for them, loss of, of employment. Um, and I feel like all of this is very aligned to this Aquarius energy of things taking a turn that we don't expect um, for a new future, for that, that create a new reality um, at the drop of a hat. You can compare it a little bit to a tower moment. Um, tower moment being like the tower card from the tarot, where you have your foundation suddenly shaken up. And Aquarian energy can be like that because um, its ruler Uranus, um, its modern ruler Uranus, uh, can be unsettling. It, it's, it's, a, it's a planet of electricity where you don't know um, where that shock is going to come from and where, where it's going to change. And although it can be, you know, startling for us and shocking, um, all of these changes are for the best because it it helps keeps us in check. It helps keep us uh, keep uh, it helps to keep us present and aware, and it helps us reflect on what we've been doing. Sometimes we go on autopilot, and then we distract ourselves from what's really going on, and we forget that maybe we don't feel so good where we are. So. Keep that in mind while you're going through it. 
Um, another thing that February uh, was shining a light on um, through Aquarius is the call for um, a new reality that that serves the whole. So to all of this, there's like a meta message that if you're doing better and if you change and you grow and you heal, then I'll do better and I'll change and I'll grow and I'll heal, heal because I'm being affected by you. If I'm part of your community, your actions are going to impact me as well. And that's pure Aquarian energy. Um, so think about it from that perspective of, of that new person that's emerging from um, these changes and from this new reality and the new steps you're taking and how you can serve your community um, and that, and how you're, you're getting closer and closer to the more authentic you um, through these changes. Um, once Mercury stations direct, we can apply then these new approaches to our lives in the way we process information, in the way we observe things, and in the way we communicate with others, as well as the way we approach things in the present. Last but not least, let's unpack that Saturn uh, in Aquarius square to Uranus and Taurus. A lot of people have been talking about it. Astrologers uh, in particular have spoken about it. And I heard the tarot lady, uh, Teresa Reed, you can find her on IG, um, comparing it to uh, um, a challenge between different versions of ourselves. She called it the new you versus the old you. The new you being Saturn in Aquarius and the old you being Uranus in Taurus. Um, and this is perfect. Uh, this is a, a very challenging transit that we are um, are experiencing. By the time you listen to this episode, you will have already gone through it. Um, but the the point here is to be able to reflect back on that experience and what came up during this time. The reason why this is so intense is because you have these two signs that that can be ego driven um, in in different ways. And can one is future oriented and one is very much in the present and very, very into its comfort. So old habits, old patterns, what usually works. And then we have Aquarius, which is like, yeah, but let's try this and this could be better. And this affects other people. And we need to think about others and, and such, which is more expansive and broad. And Aquarius being in Saturn, Saturn being oh, the father figure of the solar system is saying, hey, this is what we have to do. Um, these, these, are, these are the new rules now. And Uranus is like shaking stuff up, being resistant, saying, but this is what we used to do. Um, and this is how it used to work. So apply that to yourself and reflect on, and some of you may already be aligned to this path, whereas others may be truly struggling with this. Um, but let's face it, like change is hard. Like apply it to yourself. How hard is it for you to change a habit? Um, getting to work out. I'm going to use that one because that's the most popular one for, for most of us. That COVID-19, you know, didn't only reflect the virus. COVID-19 pounds. Hello. Anyway, um, so using that as an example, how hard it is to, to just start working out, to just start taking care of your health. These are These are important things, but they're challenging. Why? Because we like what we like. We enjoy the things we enjoy. We do the things that we do. So the and the older we get, the more challenging it becomes because growth is layered. It's not automatic and it doesn't happen quickly unless we have, um, unfortunately, sometimes a, a traumatic event or a sudden event can cause a change. But we don't want that, right? So here is Saturn saying, hey, this is how we can do it. This is how you can do it. And Uranus, Uranus and Taurus is like, yeah, but I want to dig my heels a little deeper and, and make things unstable here because this is what I want. So think about what areas in your life reflect that. Um, it's important to note that experiencing uh, a transit and transits doesn't mean that you should master the themes that arise throughout it. Um, in other words, no astrologer, um, astrology and enthusiast like moi or any normal human being should set the expectation of themselves to be able to master these themes like, oh no, the transit passed and I didn't get it done. I didn't figure it out. No, these are themes that affect us as a collective. 
And the reason why I reflected on a personal level is because I'm talking to you. But as a collective, we're all dealing with this too, with the things that we're seeing that are happening around the world. Everywhere around the world, we're seeing old rules being challenged, old foundations being challenged because we can no longer do it the way it was done. Again, it's not going to be automatic and it's not going to be quick. And that's what we need to keep in mind. So this does not mean that you have to force yourself to un- align to this if you're not ready. Um, and if you're already aligned to this, just keep going. These themes are meant to guide you and orient you. That is all. All right, moving on with your March forecast. Like, this is a doozy. There's a lot going on in March, guys. And I don't mean to scare you every time I say that. I just, I mean to be like, keeping it real with you. So March is here. Holy shit. As always, before I begin to break, break, break it down, I pull a card to get a better understanding on what we're being invited to consider and understand. This month, I'm using the Mystical Shaman Oracle deck. You can find it on online through any retailer. And I use it all of the time when I want to get in depth um, and get a sense on what is most important uh, to focus on right now in terms of invitation, medicine, in other words, the lesson of what we're experiencing at the moment. And I pulled the coyote card and the coyote card sheds light on what is called divine deception. And I know this sounds like a really clever term, and and to a certain degree it is, Um, but divine deception are those tests of faith that we endure when we ask for something from source and what we get is not what we requested, meaning that we get something opposite to what we requested, and we think that that's not what we need, and we fight against it, and we're like, that's not what I wanted, why did I get this? now? Now what? So what gives, right? Wrong, wrong. With all spiritual things, it's always like, yeah, it's not what you think it is. So here I am to channel that message for you. Ah. Anyway, there are a lot of layers, guys, to things we think we want or need. And sometimes it's only revealed to us as we move further along the path or after we get what we quote unquote wanted. Um, And that, my friends, is divine deception. That divine trickster, that um, guide that helps strengthen our ability to be discerning. Sometimes when we finally get that thing, sometimes we think that that's really what we want and we get that thing, we then realize, oh, this is not really what I wanted anyway. Um, All of that is under the guise of that divine deception that we need to experience in order to be more discerning and to grow more and to uh, be able to understand um, that in order to achieve certain things and in order to get certain things, we also need to go undergo a certain level of preparation and we also need to be prepared to receive it. Um, I know this sounds a little bit hokey, but I promise I will bring it home as I speak. Um, So let's move on. In March, we are going to be seeing uh, Mercury transitioning into the sign of Pisces, which can be tricky for Mercury for it to like believe, to have like its bearings, right? In the sign of Pisces, a water sign, a mutable water sign, meaning that it, it's adaptable, it goes with the flow. And water is like this too. So there's there's it's there's uh, less boundaries even with Pisces compared to all the other uh, mutable signs because it's a mutable element in a mutable modality. But I'll leave that for the uh, zodiac sign course uh, one day sometime in the future. In the meanwhile, let's bring it back. So Mercury will be in Pisces from March 16th through April 4th. And during, um, during that time, remaining objective and being honest with yourself will be imperative in order to keep yourself uh, on, on track. Um, otherwise, you might find yourself veering into uh, moments of like uh, following a whim or an impulse. And it's not that we all don't do this. This is normal and common. But sometimes an impulse can lead us into experiences that are not favorable for us or delays and detours that cause more distress 
um, than, than we need it at the moment. And let's face it, folks, we're already in distress, enough distress as it is. Um, but going back, so, um, and it can also lead us to act beneath our integrity and our values. Um, and, you know, that doesn't make sense at this point anymore. We know so much. We know better now. Why act beneath our, our values when we know what we have to do and how we have to behave in order to achieve better things for us and for our communities? Like, in other words, everything now is in the open. And if you know better, you do better. I don't need to talk any more about it, do I? No. Come on, let's keep going. Does that mean that all of this is easy? That acting in your highest integrity is easy? No. But as the Coyote card says, may be leading it may be leading you into challenges to ensure that you are ready to handle what you've set in motion we request things we work towards things and we fret and we we try to take shortcuts and then we have challenges and then we get upset at the challenges but we don't realize that sometimes those very challenges um or staying on our on our path in alignment is preparing us to receive what we want so sometimes we quit too early or we we extend the detour even more and that can work against us and can block us from certain blessings that we're due to receive. So I, I urge you guys to have patience, especially during this period of time where Mercury is in Pisces and your mind may be playing tricks uh, on you and you might feel a little bit, especially if you're a, a mutable sign, uh, Sagittarius, Gemini, Virgo, or Pisces, where you might feel like, oh, I just want to do whatever I want. That might be good. It might be relaxing, but you might extend your detour while you're having this organic and natural detour that's happening. That's just part of, uh, that's part for the course. And it's part of the challenge of where your, your growth lies. Um, so yeah. So during this month, we will also be transitioning into airy season on March 20th, and that will be initiating the new zodiacal new year. So Aries brings in the, the zodiac new year, and it also brings in the spring equinox. So get ready for more daylight hours, new blooms. Um, Aries always brings with it freshness and new experiences. So get ready for that. Get ready for that fresh fieriness, that, that um, sense of adventure, that sense of, of newness and excitement. But let's backtrack. Venus will be transitioning um, during the month of March. Venus will be transitioning from Pisces to Aries um, and changing the effect on um, our relationships and how we treat and view our environment. Whereas Mars will be transitioning from Taurus to Gemini. Keep in mind that these signs are not far from each other, Aries and Gemini. They're just one sign away from each other, um, which means that they will have an expansive quality um, to each other. So if you're feeling drawn to challenging yourself during this time, it will be in your favor, uh, barring that you maintain your focus and are consistent. Because similarly to Pisces, uh, Gemini is a mutable sign, and you don't want to get carried away with action. Uh, Mars and Gemini can be um, very curious, but we can be curious to a fault to the point where we're inconsistent and we can't follow through with anything. And Aries is famous for that shit. Let's just be honest. Um, not in a mean way, but Aries, you get really excited as a cardinal sign. You start new projects and then you get bored when things um, start to become a little bit too challenging or they're taking too long because you're impatient. So let's bring it back home with these two very high energy signs and let's combine those energies with Venus and Aries and um Mars and Gemini. Uh, that will occur. Um, Mars will be entering Gemini on March 3rd and Venus enters Aries on March 21st. Another transit of note is Mercury and Pisces squaring Mars and Gemini. And I thought this was really, really crucial and reflects back on what we were just talking about. This energy is a perfect example of the message of our card of the month. Something that veers us off our path with a hidden lesson is the best way to describe this transit. And how par powerful that this tension between these two signs, which is a square, which is the description of a square, it's a tension. Um, it's between two mutable signs. Pisces and Gemini are both mutable modality. They adapt, they change. They're not the signs that... that 
like Taurus and Aquarius, Leo and Scorpio that are fixed and can stick it through. These are signs that if they have to change a different direction, they just will because they can, they, they know how to, um, but if they're creating tension, that means that our boundaries will be tested when it comes to thought um, and action. Thought being represented by Mercury and Pisces and action being represented by Mars and Gemini. So sure, it may be easy to find shortcuts during this time. You may feel inclined to do that. Um, but is it, is it in alignment with your core values to take a shortcut in regards to important things that you might be trying to achieve? Um, what are you going to get out of it? And the truth is, as I process this transit, the, the more I did, I realized that this is very seven of swords energy. Um, and that connects very closely to the coyote um, from the sense of that cleverness and that cunning um, that we can demonstrate when we're trying to find the easy way out or we're trying to scheme and do things in the background that we don't want people to see in order to then show up like you did the best you could or like um, you did everything that you were supposed to um, or like... Uh, you take the credit from someone. So this, this transit is akin to those kinds of behaviors. And I really want to discourage you from acting in, in the interest of, of just fulfilling some sort of, um, impulse or need to, uh, find the easy way out because with this transit in motion, it will work against you in terms of, your ultimate growth and what and moving forward with your actual goals there there's something worth um worth it in the process and in going through an experience that helps you move forward and progress and prepare you for what you want to receive so that goes back again to that coyote card. And I really want you guys to give thought about that when you listen to this podcast episode during the month of March, we're going to be tested in those ways. And we want to be able to act in, in the highest integrity for ourselves. It's not for what other people are going to think. This year and since the end of last year, the universe, the astrology is leading us to be more authentic and to align with our most authentic selves, because that is the only way that we can better our communities and make better choices for the whole. So if you are convinced that you um, can do the work and you're a person that's all about values and that you're all about integrity, then you can do the hard things. And Newsflash, you're not fooling me, La Gitana, so don't even try it. Anyway, this is an important transit to keep an eye out for, and it will occur on March 23rd. Um, we also, during the month of March, have a new moon in Pisces on March 13th. So going a little back in the calendar, I just, that other transit really, you know, stole my attention. So apologies for, for any confusion this may cause. Um... So we have a new moon in Pisces on March 13th, and that will be closing out the axis of service that came from the full moon in Virgo at the end of February. The reason I mention this is because this new moon may feel a, a bit unset unsettling because although Pisces is a water sign, and again, I mentioned that lack of boundaries that, that Pisces makes us feel sometimes, it's not an initiator for initiation's sake, if that makes sense. Like, kind of like, Aries, who was a self-starter, or any other cardinal sign like Capricorn, Cancer, or Libra, that they just get shit started. They're they're gonna figure something out, a way to get it, to get it the ball rolling, or to get it going. Um, Pisces is different. Pisces' uh, mutability doesn't have boundaries, so uh, allow yourself to initiate things by thinking. Uh, bigger by visualizing. So things that are more abstract are, are more applicable here in order to reach goals and set intentions. intentions. Um, so be more creative with intention setting under this new moon. This will be especially accented by the moon's conjunction with Neptune. Um, so dream a beautiful dream, folks. Just don't get carried away. And this is going to happen at 5.22 a.m. Eastern time on March 13th. 
Moving on, we finally have a beautiful full moon in Libra on um, March 28th at the end of the month. And this will occur at 2.49 p.m. Eastern time. And Libra will bring the dreams home, um, those intentions we set, by helping us negotiate the terms of our contracts, right? Our mental contracts, our communication t- contracts, or actual literal contracts. There's a good opportunity for certain conversations and negotiations to take place with this full moon in Libra um, because it will be accompanied uh, by the North Node in Gemini and Saturn in Aquarius that will be forming a trine to each other. Um, as well, as the full moon in Libra in connection to the North Node in Gemini and in connection to Saturn in Aquarius. So that brings a lot of air energy, a lot of conversation, a lot of ease in communication and in making decisions together collectively. So it will help us make conclusions. Um, So speak with diplomacy, mind your P's and Q's and uphold justice because that's what Libra likes um, before it makes a decision to make sure that justice was served. Most importantly, though, before we close out, is again to be reminded of the message to be discerning and to face the challenges head on. Do not extend your detours by finding shortcuts, by uh, being afraid of tolerating a bit of discomfort or a lot of bit of discomfort sometimes. Sometimes we think that what we want comes easy because just because we want it, it takes some work. And I assure you that you can all do the hard things. Be open to accept the detours because they can sometimes lead us to lovelier places than the ones we imagined that we would end up visiting. I love you lots and I can't wait to speak to you again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye. Be sure to follow at Team Data on all social platforms. That's at T-E-A-M-D-A-Y-D-A. I'd love to hear your feedback and any topics you'd be interested in hearing. We can send your emails to hello at teamdata.com. Be sure to listen in every Wednesday on your favorite podcast platform, including YouTube, for those who appreciate closed captions. Gentle reminder to rate and review the podcast. Five stars only. Thanks, friends, fans, and fam. Until next time.